Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, for over 30 years, the SOLs, the Standards of Learning Testing, have been very controversial. But one thing is for sure, the pre- and post-COVID scores are most alarming across the entire Commonwealth. How are we to understand or interpret SOL scores? We're joining me in the conversation about the Standards of Learning Testing is Dr. Matt Hurt, Director of Comprehensive Instructional Program located in WISE. And thank you so much for being with us this evening in the conversation. Well, I tell you, so I saw your wonderful nine-part series you did uh, examining the Virginia's SOLs that uh, initially um, it was in the Bacon's Repub uh, Rebellion, but also in March it ran in the Roanoke Times, and it was very informative indeed and revealed a lot that I really had no idea of. Uh, but before we get to some of uh, the information, um, first tell us what the Comprehensive Instructional Program, what is that? Yes, sir. Well, we are currently a consortium of 47 public school divisions that were started down in Region 7, which is far southwest Virginia. So when you're looking at the state of the map, or the map of the state, just think about Radford and everything west of there. That's Region 7, 19 divisions. And this consortium was began by the superintendents back in 2014 because prior to that, the state had really ramped up the rigor on the math and reading SOL test. And when that happened, scores plummeted across the state. And our school accreditation ratings are based on those scores, so the percentage of schools fully accredited also plummeted. Now, everybody had been suffering through the Great Recession since 2008. School divisions, budgets took a hit. Usually the central office was the first place to feel that pain. So as people retired or moved on to new positions, they just simply didn't replace those positions. So there were fewer people left to lead the kind of change necessary to overcome the challenges of those new and more rigorous SOL tests. So they decided why don't we just work together on this? So they pulled their talents and resources and put this thing they called the CIP together. And the mission of the CIP is to improve outcomes for kids, primarily as measured by the SOL test. So what we do each year is we get teams of teachers together. They make our instructional planning for the following year. They, they tell us what, what our pacing guides, our instructional materials, our common assessments are. They tweak those, they make them how they want them to be, and then we implement them the following year. And, um, you know, the, the, the SOLs have certainly been around uh, a long time. I came to Virginia in 1988. It seems like uh, it, it was in the 90s or something. Could you give us a little history in terms of the start and beginning of the SOLs? Yeah, now the SOLs, I can't recall exactly the first year that no. the actual standards were developed, uh, but they upgraded them in 1995. And then we implemented brand new tests based on those newer standards in 1998. Prior to that, we used the literacy passport test, and that was the barrier for a diploma in Virginia, which that was based on sixth grade level skills. And we gave it in sixth grade, and if a kid didn't pass it in sixth grade, then we gave it in seventh and eighth and, until they finally did pass it, and then they could get their diploma along with the required cr credits that they needed. Uh, and I believe the thinking was back in the 90s that we needed to make a Virginia diploma worth more. So they, that's where they come up with the idea of verified credits. That means not only do the grades say that the kid made the score, but then we have this uh, objective test that also verified that yes, they did master what they were supposed to in that class. So that was the idea of that. And of course, we do the verified credits at the high school. And I think the thinking was that we couldn't just wait until high school before we started testing kids. We needed to make sure that they were attaining the skills as they matriculated through the grades. So they initially put those tests down at some of the elementary and middle school grades. And then a few years later, uh, with No Child Left Behind in 2001, that required us to make sure that we were testing kids in reading and math at least each year in grades three through eight. And you know, as I recall, uh, early on, it was very favorable. I mean, people wanted to know, is my child learning? Are they learning? Um, and so it was kind of popular. But, you know, I have to say for over a decade, well over a decade, I, I, teachers constantly, and some of them are my friends, say that it's too much pressure, that they have to teach to the test. They have to not cover other materials so I can get those students prepared to take the test. Is that a legitimate argument. 
I think it is in certain content areas. For example, in history. I was a history major in college, and I never saw the first multiple choice test while I was going to UVA Wise. Uh, everything we did was written exams, and in my mind, that is probably the best way to assess what we want those kids to walk out of those classes with. The current SOL test, they've tried to fix it in recent years, but it's kind of been uh, a, a more of a test of their rote memory skills because in our curriculum frameworks, which is the working documents we use to work with kids, it lists specific things that kids need to be able to regurgitate, in other words, on the SOL test. And if they can memorize those things, they can pass those. They're not very skill-based. Science is a little bit more like that, but now reading and math, they're very much skill-based assessments. You cannot give a kid a list of numbers and have them memorize those things and then do well on the SOL test. Similarly, on the reading SOL test, Kids are presented with brand new cold reads that they have to read the, the content and they have to answer specific questions about that content, which does gauge their ability to access that, those contents. So those reading and math are very much skills. We cannot teach to the test. Uh, the other thing about reading and math is that those skills build upon themselves each year. So for example, in, when we bring kids into kindergarten, there are no academic prerequisites to a kid entering kindergarten. They don't have to know any, they don't have to have any kind of academic skills. We start by teaching the letters, the letter sounds, we start to blend them together. Then in first grade, we build up on that. In second grade, we build up on that, and so on and so forth up through high school. If we don't follow the prescribed instruction at each step in the way, in, in each grade, then the kids are going to have gaps. Think of it like when Henry Ford came up with the assembly line. He didn't just tell the workers, you all do what you want to at each step of the way. He gave them a very prescribed set of instructions that at this station you have to put this, these parts together, torque them down to this specification, and so on, because if he didn't, that Model T would not have started at the end of the, of the line. Um, so. What would you say is the role of the teacher then in terms of the SOLs? I mean, should they be held accountable for performance then? If they're not, who else is working with that kid in that classroom? Mm -hmm. uh, the teacher has the primary responsibility of making sure that the kid get, gets from where they are at the beginning of the year to where they need to be at the end of the year. And again, if you look at the standards themselves, we're not making huge jumps from one year to the next. They're pretty well sequentially lined out that it makes a lot of sense to go from this to this to this to this. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to be a teacher for sure because we're not dealing with automatons, we're not programming robots. We're working with kids who are as individual as the snowflakes and every kid comes to the class with a different set of problems and a different set of challenges and a different set of, of, of experiences. So, you know, the teacher is the only person who can make that happen with that kid. And if, if they're not held accountable, then why are we even sending our kids to school? You know, the SOL scores were released um, um, in uh, uh, August, and it caused a great deal of concern. 66% overall passed math exam compared to 82% in 2018-19. 65% passed the science compared to 81% in that 2018-19, and reading was only down 5%. The fact of the matter is, there really is a pre and post COVID impact with the drop of the scores. Yes, sir. And, and before I start out talking about the generalities, it's, I think it's important to touch on the difference of why the reading did not go down as much as the other content areas. In 2019, we gave a different reading SOL test as far as the cut scores than we gave in 21 and 22. Kids had to get a higher portion of the problems correct in order to earn a passing score on the old test, and they have to get a fewer number of the items correct on the newer test to pass. The rigor, all that kind of stuff pretty much remained constant between the two. It's just that we lowered our expectations significantly on the new test. So that really masks the fact that our kids are not nearly as well off in reading as those numbers would suggest. It's probably more akin to what you're seeing with the, the math and the, uh, the science. But as far as the drop in scores, 
we haven't been able to fully analyze the 2022 data just yet. But when we looked at the difference between 19 to 21, we found that there were two factors that really impacted scores more than anything else that we found. And that was the fact when you look at the poverty rate of that division combined with the amount of in-person instruction that they offered to kids that year, that accounted for 47% of the variance in SOL scores from division to division. Wow. wow. Um, do you think, in your opinion, that um, the SOLs are doing what they were supposed to do? I think in reading and math they are. Um, I think with the science, with the new SOL tests and science that we're going to be administering this, this spring, it's going to be more skill-based and less rote memory dependent, so I think that's going to be better. They have tried to bring the history up to snuff as far as the skills, but it's very, very difficult to assess uh, history, real history skills in an objective manner like that. But in, in reading and math, yes, because if a kid is proficient from year to year, that means that they're going to have those foundational skills that they need to learn anything else that they need to know. Well, how should parents um, and citizens use the scores? I mean, if I look at my school that uh, they go to, if they're not performing well as a parent, um, should I uh, make some noises? Um, uh, principals should be accountable? Superintendents, in other words, as a citizen, what should a parent and citizens do when they're looking at the scores and, and, and trying to think about them? As far as a parent, definitely, if your kid's not progressing and they're not being proficient on those tests, that's, that's a problem and that needs to be addressed. And, and there's all kinds of, of, of supports that can be put in place to help those kids be more successful. Uh, as far as a community member, yes, I, I think we do need to hold our schools and our school divisions and our school boards accountable for those results. Because one of the things that we have found, and in, in the studies have borne this out year after year, is that the biggest determinant of a student's or a classroom's achievement is that teacher. The biggest determinant of a school's performance is that principal. Same thing at the division level. It's, it's the, it's, it, it, mm. it, at those higher levels, it goes back to the leadership. And um, I'm assuming, would you indeed say that when it comes to um, standards of accreditation, that scores should be a, 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 an important part of that accreditation process? I think that they should, because um, otherwise we need to redefine what it is that we're trying to accomplish. You know, in public education, you know, my thought is, and, and I know this varies from person to person, but my thought is that we need to give kids the skills that they need so that they can go on and be successful. And I cannot think of two more important skills to have than literacy and numeracy skills. And even if it does mean in terms of teacher evaluations, is there remedial for teachers or two strikes right? In other words, it can be cause for dismissal if there's not good performance that teachers can demonstrate. That is true, but now there is a double-edged sword to that. Mm -hmm. uh, because first of all, if you were to not retain a teacher due to performance issues, where in the world are you gonna find a replacement to go in that classroom <laughs> these days? So that, is, that in itself is an issue. However, one of the things that we have seen with several uh, of our school divisions, when they increase their expectations and they communicated that via the evaluation system, those teachers rose to meet those expectations. It, 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 and the same thing at the classroom level. When teachers' expectations increase, more kids will rise to meet those expectations. Um, conversely, when we look at things from the other side, when we have lower expectations, how many people rise above that? Well, yeah. And so um, you did say and made it clear the teachers themselves should be in charge of curricular decision making. Um, not only just full partnership, but they are the, should lead the way. Yes, sir. As it turns out, we don't have standardized teachers. Each teacher comes to the classroom with a specific set of skills, with a specific set of likes and dislikes and, and that kind of thing. 
And when we try to mandate that everybody do something a certain way, some people can be successful with that, and other people, that just doesn't fit their skill set. So when we convey to teachers, here's our expectations. You have these kids. We need them to be this successful by the end of the year. We're here to support you. Otherwise, we're going to get out of your way and let you work. We tend to find that that yields much better success than when we try to spoon feed teachers specific strategies, resources, materials, and that kind of thing. You know, I read that one of the criticisms about the uh, SOLs is it really doesn't measure um, what they would call higher level thinking, uh, uh, critical thinking, problem solving, that it's just too much, quote, content and information. How do you respond to that criticism? They're exactly right when it comes to the history test specifically and to a certain degree the science test. But when we're talking about those skill-based tests, that is even partially true when you're looking at the pass rates because a 400 is the bare minimum passing score on Virginia SOL tests. And if that's all you look at, that's not saying a whole lot. But we do have another level of performance, which is pass advanced. And for a kid to get those pass advanced scores, they have to evidence extremely higher cognitive uh, outcomes than the kids who just get a simple pass. So when you look at the pass advanced rates, that's where you're talking about measuring those higher level skills. You know, um, over my uh, 40 years in terms of higher education, um, I'd like to have a dollar for every student, especially in the last decade or more, who said, I just don't do well on standardized tests. I cannot take multiple choice tests whatsoever. Is there some validity to that? That is to say, is there such a thing as not being good at, quote, standardized testing? I would imagine, and I have probably seen some kids that did meet that criteria. You know, kids who are so eat up with anxiety that whenever they have that test put in front of them that they just kind of freeze up. However, I've not seen many of those kids. Um, they certainly exist. Most of the time when we have kids that are not performing on a standardized test, the vast majority of time it's because they were not prepared and they did not have the skills necessary to do well on that test. You know, um, we have experienced, um, and I guess, I, and I'm speaking absolutely from experience, that the entering freshmen, even though, wow, good scores, wow, good grades in school, wow, are just not really prepared. Um, a year ago, for the first time, the School of Communication, we had to implement a grammar test in the introductory class. And you had to pass, you could take it a thousand times, but you had to pass the test before you could go on to the next. And it's almost like some of the remedial that we're finding. And so it doesn't seem to be a correlation between the SOL score and necessarily the grades that they receive. That is true, and we found that as well. And, and the, the worst thing about that is it varies by subgroup of students. We have some student, some subgroups of students who their grades line up with their SOL proficiencies closer than others. Uh, the biggest egregious difference is with our students with disabilities. Uh, when we did an analysis of our 2019 data a few years ago, and we looked at how those grades lined up with those proficiencies, we found that our special ed kids were far more likely to get A's, yet fail the SOL test with an A in the class. Um, and, and we found the same thing with different subgroups, so the difference between black and white kids. Our black kids uh, in that same data set were three times more likely to fail if they got an A than the white kids who got an A. And that goes back to, I think, a difference in expectations. Um, so there is a divide between in classroom and performances and then in terms of um, uh, using technology and zoom uh, yet those in education field say wait a minute no 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 some of the the instructional online can be equal to or better than even in person but yet pre and post covid that seems to be a little bit confusing what's your thoughts on that between in person in, in terms of online? It depends on the family supports in the home. Absolutely. If, if you have the family that has the wherewithal, that has the time, that has the interest to sit down with their kid and make sure they're attending to their schoolwork, make sure they're dialing into their Zoom meetings, that can be very successful. 
when we have the families that the parents are out working two or three jobs or they're living with mamma and mamma don't even know what a computer is. And if, if, they're, if kids are left to their own devices, a lot of times they will find other more engaging things to entertain themselves with. And that's one of the reasons why we feel that the correlation between uh, the amount of in-person instruction in 21 and the poverty rate played such a big role in the scores. You know, one thing that you, that you wrote that I found uh, very interesting, and it's counterintuitive, for me it was. I found interesting that you reported in the series that was published that the public schools in far southwest Virginia are the least well-funded per student, they have the highest rate of students with disabilities, and second highest rates of those living in poverty. But this region had the highest proficiency rates on the SOLs. Yes, sir. And how do you explain that? Well, when we found that out, we interviewed a ton of teachers and administrators, and we asked them just that. How in the world can you all get those kind of scores facing those challenges? Oh, you left off, they're the least well paid in the state. Oh, okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when we asked them that, they all gave us two answers that were fairly common uh, among all the, the interviews that we had. The first was that we turned everything over to the teachers. The teachers made the instructional decisions for the next year. We brought them in together across divisions. Now we bring them in across states and they, they work together and they come to an agreement on this is what our pacing guide is. We're gonna teach this stuff here, that stuff there. They come to an agreement on what our tests are. They look at each individual test with a very fine tooth comb and they made it what they want them to be. Uh, they tell us what extra resources that they need and then it's our job to follow what they tell us to do. Uh, so that was one thing. The second thing that they talked about were the resources that the comprehensive instructional program provides for them, most of which are provided by those same teachers. So we're talking about those pacing guides which are very critical and the common assessments which are very much aligned to the SOL test. Uh, the other thing that the CIP does is we do a lot of data work. If it'll stand still for more than two seconds, we measure it and we report the results of that. And it does a couple things. Number one, it helps us to set our expectations because if we look at our results compared to everybody else's, that lets us know if we're doing okay, if we're doing poorly, if we need to make any changes. We also monitor our progress throughout the year to see if we're on track to meeting our targets or not. And then we also monitor our progress from year to year as well. So we only have three minutes or so remaining. What, what, how is Virginia students doing? Um, where are we failing? What is the next step that you see? Retain SOLs for the revisions, and I know there's some discussion now on some of the, of the revisions of them. Give us a, a snapshot of where we are and where we should go forward. Well, we have been losing ground relative to the rest of the country, according to the NAEP test a few, uh, over the past few years. It's not been a significant drop, but it has been a drop. Um, I do think that we have some things in place that are going to help us to be successful that could probably stand some tweaks, but not major overhauls. For example, we have very well-defined standards, so our teachers know exactly what's expected of them. We have very reliable assessment programs, so that way that we can look at our data and see where we're not doing well. We have a fairly robust uh, accountability process with our accreditation. And all those things together are some of the things that we see have helped Virginia to come to be in the top 10 states in the nation when it mm -hmm. comes to those NAEP results. Again, I don't think that we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's probably some tweaks to make some of those things better than they are. I'm sure none of them are perfect, but I would very much be concerned with significant changes to any of those things. And finally, um, is there a generational difference in terms of the teachers in younger versus older experience, less experience, and performance on SOL? This year there was for sure. In fact, each year we identify our top five teachers of our most, our top five most successful teachers of our most at-risk kids for every SOL test. And this year, one of the things that really stood out to us is that a significant number of those folks were brand spanking new teachers. And as it turns out, when we talked with our administrators and different people, we came to consensus that our veteran teachers 
knew what life was like prior to COVID and how COVID destroyed the outcomes for our kids. So our veteran teachers realized that our kids could not be as successful. Now the brand new teachers did not get that memo, so they went ahead and made them be successful anyway. They didn't have those lower expectations. They kept their expectations high and their kids did really well. Now that's not all of them, mm -hmm. but we had a significant number of those teachers that were very, very successful. And so expectations and not being all that fearful as related to meeting those standards. And, and expectations, that's what it all boils down to. Whenever we talk to our most successful teachers, our most successful schools, and our most successful divisions, they all have very high expectations and we measured them. Well, that's all the time we have. I want to thank my very special guest, Dr. Matt Hurt, who's director of the Comprehensive Instruction Program. And I want to thank you for joining us and hope you would do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton. Mm -hmm.